Let's get it rolling. Let's get it rolling. How y'all doing, Dallas? Good. All right. I like the energy in Dallas. Y'all came early. Usually, people start getting here like six. I mean, five forty-five, six. So. Jay's on his way. I'm going to introduce myself before y'all think who is this weird dude up here on the mic. Um, my name is Brandon Wigley. I'm vice president of Jay Morrison Academy. So I'll tell my brief story real fast. And um, before, before I get into my story, then, who all brought water today? Oh, damn. Okay, y'all. So show it up and show it out. Yeah, I see that. So at the end, uh, I know some people brought some water early. But at the end, we'll collect all the water. We'll probably be done around 7.30ish. So at the end, Jay will probably do a last call and everybody bring up the water. Uh, we have the new Black Panther Party coming up from Houston. Uh, we work very closely with them, some good people over there. And um, they're going to come get the water and drive it back down to Houston. So that's definitely going to be love. Um, also, before I tell my story, I like to... We, who's all been to a corner class before? Everybody first one? Nobody went last year? Oh, you have King? Cool, bet. You was in Houston? Last year. All right, bet, bet. Appreciate it. Appreciate you coming again. So I'll give you a brief, you know, um, what to expect. i open it up. Jay will come on. Then we have Queen Ernestine come on and do a poem, and then we'll close it out. When Jay comes, he likes to go around the crowd, um, shake everybody's hands, whether they say kiss hands and shake babies or something like that. Y'all know what I'm saying. Um, so definitely get your phones out. <laughs> say, yeah, you know, shake the babies. I done messed the whole damn thing up. <laughs> the police over there too. They not gonna get my ass. But yeah, so, but yeah, definitely get your phones out. You know, Jay is big on social media, so he definitely like you guys to post. If you post anything today, you want to hashtag that. I should have hashtagged it. But um, if you can, if you can do that for us on via social media, hashtag Dallas Corner Class and hashtag Buy Back the Block. If you if you can do that for me, I know everybody on their phone on social media. Um, before I get started as well, do we already have any? Do we have any investors already? Real estate investors. Let me get you up here, King. Let me get. Like I said, we like to use this as a networking tool. I don't want everybody just to come out here. Let me get what's your day one. Yeah, let me get you too, King. I don't like for, we don't like for people just to come out here and just, you know, just look at Jay and of course you're going to get a, a great lesson plan, but we use this as networking. I'm going to pass a couple of our past cities, we had people meet at the corner class and was able to start doing it. deals together. So that's our whole purpose of being out here, I is to not only learn, but the fellowship as well, with like-minded individuals. So let me get your kings up here, if you don't mind. Do we have any queens that invest though? It's always the men that's investing. You don't have nobody? All right, we're going to make it. You do back there. I seen your hand up back there. I'm going to call your ass out if I see you. You do? You invest? Come on now. Yeah, bring, bring it on up there. <laughs> I'm just thinking. Yeah. I forgot about Shot. it. What's your name, King? My name is Nikhil Leonard. Nikhil Leonard. So how long have you been investing in, um, in this area? About three years now. Uh, I'm in Fort Worth, so I need to follow around. There it is. Okay. Cool. So what I like to ask people as well, can you tell us about you know, some pros and cons that you face in your three years of, oh yes, your shades, hard as hell too. Um, <laughs> you have some pros and cons that you face while investing here in, um, in the area. Well, the pros obviously is, you know, you're working for yourself, you're putting in all the time, and, and you're reaping most of the benefits. Uh, started out wholesaling, you know, Got a few houses under contract, made a few, did a few deals, uh, trying to advance and move on and just build my business up. Um, some of the cons that go along with it is, oh, talking to sellers, man. Yeah, yeah. Talking to sellers and trying to convince them to, you know, sell me the house. You know, you, you send all the marketing out and sometimes people will call you or send you letters back or whatever, cuss you out tell you to beat it, you know, so those are, those are the negatives for me. Before you get off, tell the people one piece of advice about investing in Dallas that you would give them since you already been investing. Stick with it. Stick with it. Great Stay advice. consistent. Great advice. Don't stop. Yeah, yeah, I like that shirt. Let me see. Where you get that from? Derrick Jackson. Derrick Jackson, man. All right. Appreciate you, bro. Appreciate it. What's your name? What was your name again? Nikhil. Nikhil. So everybody need to meet the king right here. He's been investing in the city for three years. So before you go, definitely get, you have cars on you? Yes, sir. Yeah, I will pass them out, king, definitely. Got you right here, bro. All right, introduce yourself and some pros and cons and how long you've been investing in the city, bro. Uh, my name is James Tennyson. Uh, I'm from here. I've been investing for about a year. I say 
one of the things you really want to do is hook up with somebody who knows more than you. You don't have to be an expert. Bring it up. You don't have to be an expert. You just got to know one. So pretty much just getting out there and sticking with it, like my man said over here. Uh, getting off the clock to go work for yourself is probably one of the hardest things going along with this because you get off of work and you're tired. So just drink your Red Bull, do what you gotta do, do whatever you gotta do to hype yourself up, and just keep working. Give a, give a um, round of applause for the Kings right there, man. Make the moves in the city. That's always good. Um, we were down in Houston last month, so Houston is a pretty, was a pretty good market at that time, man. Sorry to, you know, here definitely what happened. But like I said, I introduced myself. My name's Brandon J. Wigley, Vice President of J. Morrison Academy. Um, I started off just pretty much just like you all, man. I, I knew nothing about real estate. I'm from Florida. Uh, go Gators. Go Gators. Uh, no, y'all don't fuck with Gators. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, but I'm from Florida. Um, I was about, I was 23. I went to school to be a teacher, an educator. I guess I'm still educating now. Um, I went to school to be a teacher, and at that time, I didn't really feel fulfilled. You know, I'm in the classroom. I'm coaching high school basketball. Um, but I didn't, you know, it was all right for me, but I didn't feel fulfilled like the King said. I always wanted, I had that entrepreneur bug in me at an early age. So around 23, 24, one of my best friends in college, he lived in Atlanta, and he said, Wig, they called me Wig, my last name Wigley. They said, Wig, the A where it's at, you need to come up here. And me, I'm an action taker. You know, a lot of times we, we think on things too long, and we think about, oh man, if, what happened if this doesn't work, or uh, what, what my family will think about me, or whatever, or whatnot. But me, I, if something makes sense, I just do it. So I picked up, I moved to Atlanta, I had $700 to my name. I was 23 at the time, and I picked up and I moved to Atlanta with $700 in my name. And at this time, this was J. Cole Friday Night Lights. That brought me through like Kim Rashad. What's up, man? I see you over that creek. What's up, How you doing? What's happening? That you might have been my age when you came up here for a reason, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Talk to him. Each and every day, every one of y'all struggle and y'all be. You got faith that it must have seen. Beautiful black people, beautiful black people, black and brown people, beautiful. Thank you, Queen. Thank you. But yeah, so I, I picked up and I moved to Atlanta. Um, I was 23, 24 at the time, had $700. I was living on my homeboy couch. And um, at this time, you know, like she said, I, my faith was always strong though. You know, I, you know, living on 23 years old, sleeping on the couch in Atlanta, that shit ain't cool, <laughs> to be honest. You know, they say Atlanta, Black Hollywood, so I wasn't living up to that Black Hollywood status, I guess. But um, from there, I looked at Jay, I was on YouTube, and everybody, anybody familiar with the credit video Jay did? A long time ago, he had the Burberry sleeves rolled up, and that was my first interaction with Jay. Um, at the time, I wasn't, uh, I had, I worked at Target for a year, and then I quit Target again. I, I quit a job fast as hell. I don't, I can't be there for more than a year, like, it's like, nah, I can't do it. So that was my last job, I was 25, that's the last time I clocked in for somebody. I'm 31 now, I know I'm up here looking 19. <laughs> no, no, okay. I look 31. I look 31. No, but that's my, I was 25. I was sitting, I had invested in some tax offices. And I was sitting in my office and I saw Jay. And at that time, I was like, man, I never seen a black man really talk about real estate and was swaggy with it. You know, so most of the time, you know, you see the guys on HDTV and all that. But I never seen anybody I can relate to. So right then and there, that's when the Jay Morrison Academy first came out. And like I said, again, I'm an action taker. If something makes sense to me, I just do it. I don't think about it. So I joined the Academy. I was probably, I was first, yeah, I was a part of the first graduating class. Anybody in the Jay Morrison Academy here? That's it, damn, we ain't doing our job then, huh? So hopefully, y'all, did y'all know about our summer school special? Anybody? Raise a hand. That's it. 
Okay, we got to tighten up on our, you did, you in it? I'm in there. Okay, damn, damn. You, you said it proud too, I'm in here, you heard <laughs> She said that thing proud, that's what's up. So yeah, so I joined the Jay Morrison Academy and from there, like I, like the um, key said, I started out real estate wholesaling. Anybody familiar with wholesaling? Okay, so I started a wholesaling. Pretty much you're just the middle man in deals. And I made my first 18 grand. That was a lot to me at that time because I made it in two months. I'm like, shit, I can make 18 in two months. So I, I blew it. I went to Miami. I went to KOD. I had rented an Audi. I had a condo. I blew it. I ain't gonna lie. I, I was 25 at the time. I ain't never had 18 grand in two months. So I blew the whole, um, the whole money. But what I learned through that whole situation, being in the academy, I learned how to put systems in place. Now I had a business. So not only did I make that 18, I was over, able to make it over and over. So fast forward a couple years, and this is before I even met Jay, this all online. So like I said, once again, I'm an action taker. Jay started doing one-on-one -on -one coaching. So I, I told myself, if I can make 18 grand without Jay, what can I do with Jay? So I had to make that investment. I ain't gonna lie to you, the investment was 15 grand. But I'm like, shoot, I can make 18 without Jay. I can make this back easy. So I got with Jay, we did a one-on-one -on -one coaching from there. You know, it's just been history now. Like, I started off as just a student, to an intern, to working in our call center, to now being vice president. So I said that all that story to say, man, I'm no different from nobody out here. I just I just like to preach, and not even preach to people because I'm not T.D. Jakes, but I just like to tell people, be action takers, man. Like, be action takers. And I think that's what, what stops us a lot from getting to where we want to be because we think too much on it. Like we just had a $17 summer school special and a lot of people passed on it. A lot of people say, oh, I gotta wait till I get paid Friday or it's $17. You spent $17 last night. You know, you spent $17 doing something. Now it ain't $17 no more, y'all missed out on it, but it's still at a reasonable price. So I'm not, you know, I don't want to come up here in this, you know, pub or our academy, but at the same time, I'm a living testimony of it. I'm a product of the product. And it definitely changed my life to where now I'm able to travel the country and meet meet like-minded individuals everywhere. So I've seen you sneak over here, so we're gonna get you on the mic. No, you don't want to get on the mic? You gotta say two words, because you're the only queen represent. I'm gonna make it good. Okay, all right, come on. <laughs> so being that you're the only queen here, I want you to tell you know your experiences, how I've been invested in so far for you here in Dallas. I'm saying actually I'm just getting started with investing. My name is Steve. And um, but I have had a property for a long time that's been rented out for like twelve years. Um, I didn't really know about investing, but I'm getting started right now. So, so how did you um, learn? Like how did you start learning? Just messing around on YouTube, seeing videos, saw some videos with Jay and some other people. Okay. I learned about wholesaling and YouTube. You took action. Time. Yeah. Okay. So what was your Round of applause. Anybody that comes up on the mic, you definitely want to show some love. Um, is anybody, is everybody familiar with probate properties? Anybody familiar with probates? So, simple terms is just people that inherit properties. It's like, say, if my grandmother died, I'm from Florida, she dies in Florida, um, and she leaves me the property, but I live in Georgia, and so, so forth. So, for me, that was, I found a niche, and I actually learned it off YouTube. I didn't learn it in Jay Morrison Academy, to be honest. But I learned it in YouTube, and I was like, you know what, in Atlanta it's pretty big. I'm, I'm not sure if it's big as Dallas, but everybody was focused in the city. And I kind of live on the outskirts. I live on the north side where the Migos are from. The north, that way, whatever they say. So that's where I'm at. So I'm like, you know what, since everybody in the city, everybody dropping signs, everybody sending mailers within like East Atlanta and the city, I'm just gonna focus only on, solely on Gwinnett County and solely on probates. And from there, it's a lot of tedious work because you gotta go sit down in front of the computer and look up everybody will. So I went in there and it's public record in Georgia. I'm not sure how it is in Dallas, it might be different because I know in Georgia, every county is a little different. So I would go sit in front of the computer three, four hours, me and my business partner. Um, we'll be in the courthouse, we'll eat lunch there, everything, and just really go down and take down everybody's number um, who has a will and we'll call them. Now, with probates, you don't get your ass cussed out like a lot because you're dealing with people you know, it's a touchy situation. You call the people, someone grandmother just died, and you call them, hey, let me buy your house. And you're like, damn, bro, my grandmama just died three days ago. So now I don't, I don't, 
I don't, I give them a little time. For probates, I give them about three or four months and then I'll call. But that would help me. I found a niche in, within wholesaling. And then from there, I was able to purchase my first duplex, live in one unit, rent out the other unit. Then I made my mama pull out her 401k. And then we, me and her purchased um, a four unit down in Melbourne, Florida. So from there, I like to buy home properties. I don't fix and flip, but that's never been me. I like to get those checks every month. So I like with, with one of my business partners say that mailbox money. So that, that kind of helped me. If that answers your question. How often do I do it? Uh, oh, it, it like the great philosopher Rick Ross say, you hustle determine your salary. You know what I mean? And to be honest, I really don't wholesale no more. I did in the beginning and I was always on it. So like I said, I made that 18 and I was able to duplicate it. But um, if you really, everybody different, man. It, I always go back to work ethic and how fast you take action. Cause I've seen people in our academy start when I start and still hasn't made, done a deal yet. But they started back in 2013 when I started. So how often it happened, it really on the person, man. And really, for me it happened fast because I found a niche. I like to find niches in things. A lot of times I don't like to be very broad. I like to be real specific with things. So, any other questions? What's happening, bro? For me, for me, I never wanted to be an agent because it feel like a job. And I hate them jobs. I hate when somebody tell you when to go to lunch at one o'clock. I'm not hungry at one o'clock. I don't want to eat yet. Like I hated that about working the job. Like I said, I, I, I stopped. I haven't worked a job since I was 25. But that's just me. I know people that are real estate agents and they're killing me. You know what I mean? And that's just something they're passionate about. But for me, I don't think you have to be an agent to be an investor. But what between that? That's it. The young lady that was up here, she said she's an agent and also an investor, and she helps educate, yeah, and she helps educate, um, you know, new homeowners and investors as well. So I think if you are an agent and you're an investor, it's a double whammy, for sure. Um, like when it comes to uh, incorporating the LLC, that person is yeah, every property, um, I'm not a lawyer, so that's my disclaimer. You gotta do that kind of shit. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, every property you wanna put under your LLC for sure. If especially an investment property. You just create different LLCs. So if you buy this property, that'd be one, two, three LLC. You buy that one, one, two, three, four, however you wanna do it. Mm -hmm. um, taxes, taxes. Cause say if, say if you have everything under one LLC, somebody sue you at this one, now they can take all your property. You know what I mean? But if you just have this one under that one, and then that's it. Well, the brother, the king right here, no, he can answer. I'm trying to buy that quad, like four properties in one. So I'm going But no, the quad, if you got a quad, it's just four doors. It's all considered one unit, but Well, not one unit, but it's all together. You'll buy it under that one, let's see. Anybody else? Anybody else? No question, y'all just ready for Jay, huh? Y'all like, get me off the mic. Right, man. I know. What's, What's up, bro? What time that class starts tomorrow? Six o'clock. Six o'clock. Where, Where is it? Um, Where is it? I don't it's know. At the Marriott. Yeah, it's at the Marriott. Yeah, it's at the Marriott. 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 For tomorrow event, if you go to J. Morrison Academy, I'm going to write it. So for tomorrow night event, tomorrow is really the event. You know, tomorrow is when you really, we really dig deep into how to get the bag, as Jay likes to say. We really deep, dig deep into, you know, for investors. It's not even just for real estate, and, uh, real estate investors, it's for business owners. So if you have a salon or you want to open a barbershop or fund a movie or whatever it is, um, tomorrow is that class that will teach you how to take your personal credit and to start getting finance and business credit. So if you go to jmorrisonacademy.com forward slash events, you find Dallas and it's the credit to cash. It's only $50. It's only $50. You don't want to miss this one. That one, we get Jay and we are Roundtree um, that teaching that class. So it's very information. Yeah, you can do it right on your phone. Right on your phone. Go to um, my phone. Oh, my phone. Yeah, go to jmorrisonacademy.com forward slash events. But if you want to...
And then I have the address there. If you do want to pay at the door, you can too. It's an extra ticket though. It's fifteen dollars more, but so you might as well just pay online. So at the door is seventy five. Online is fifty. All right. What time I got, y'all? What time I got? Kiss it up. All right, there we go, there we go. We got the man. Now, hold on, let me give him his theme music real quick. Let me give him his theme. Never mind, you got my phone. What up, bro? I got a question. Oh, when you first started, where you get the contract from? Joe Morrison Academy. We got him in our, no, real talk. Real talk, we got him in our. JMA Live, talk to him. Y'all let's say hey to my JMA Live real quick. What's going on? What's up? What up, what up? All right. Y'all don't like me, Dallas, bro. Y'all don't like me. What I did to y'all. Like, every other city, they show me love. I just I don't know what I did to Dallas. God damn. All right. Hold on, y'all. So we're going to bring Jay up to the mic. The man of many names. Can y'all guess? Can, can anybody give me the three names Jay go by? Young Malcolm. Young Malcolm is one. Mr. Real Estate. Mr. Real Estate is two. King Jay? Yeah, we ain't giving y'all that. I'm not giving y'all that one. That was too easy. He got he go by another one. He he re, he rarely use it though. Hip hop the way. No, that ain't it either. I was just fucking with you. Like, you know, you see how I, I made you feel like you had it though. You my boy though, because you over there answering all the questions. Now he go by yep. No, what is it? Dominican J. Dominican J. Y'all ain't know that one. When he have his flip flops on, he Dominican J. Y'all retired Dominican J? You retired the key? Go. No, no, he didn't retire. So yeah, hello y'all. Let me get on. We're about to bring Jay up. I'm about to play this theme music for Jay. Has it everyone heard our um, our short song by Back the Block? Y'all heard it? Y'all rocking with it? Y'all like it? Cool. Y'all know that with me, right? Bars? Bars? No? I want bars. Well, y'all don't like me, bro. You say you heard me say y'all like the thing, right? She did so I get a little better. All right, without further ado, Jay's gonna go around and definitely show everybody some love. I got the key wheel back there in the cut. What's happening? This is, can we step up for me real quick? So we got Real Wild Tree. He's gonna be teaching the class tomorrow, the $50 class that everybody wants to attend tomorrow. Peace, family. What's up? Peace, family. 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 And y'all let you know what to expect tomorrow. All right, peace everybody, how y'all doing? Dallas, feel good out here. Small team helmet, so it's pretty cool. So for those who don't know me, I'm Will Roundtree. I'm the credit master here at the J. Morrison Academy. And uh, I'm originally from, uh, well, I live in Las Vegas, originally from Milwaukee. Now, how many people are signed up for tomorrow's event? All right, that's it? All right, let me tell you guys why you want to be there. Who's here to, want to be a real estate investor? All right, generally, what's some of the issues when it comes to investing in real estate? What's that? Credit, what else? Money. Those are the two things we're gonna show you how to do. On average, we're helping clients and our students get an average of thirty to $50,000, upwards to a quarter of a million dollars to invest in their real estate. So if you guys don't see the value in investing $50 to learn how to get up to 50,000, I mean, you're cheating yourself. So how many people are gonna sign up today after we leave this event? Uh, you see them, Brandon? You're taking notes. All right, so I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get started in a minute. Appreciate that, brother. Appreciate you, King. All right, once again, if you do have water, we'll be collecting that at the end. But if you have it on you right now, we can definitely take it right now. But, yeah, yeah, if you, and if you, whoever brings the most um, amount of water, you get a free coaching session with Jay himself. And then I'll rap on the phone for y'all, get y'all the bars. Y'all okay. better start laughing at me. Alright, so we got Jay coming up in the meantime. We're going to play a little jam for y'all. Come out, and I appreciate all you for coming out. I love to come out. I know y'all been waiting. I 
been standing here. We want to get started, but I want to show y'all some love, and I want to feel y'all love and y'all energy. And for those who don't know, my name is Jay Morrison, as Brandon said, also known as Mr. Real Estate, and young Malcolm for the right here on Malcolm X and MLK uh, for the for the work we do in, in honoring Malcolm's blueprint for our community and his uh, his ideologies and philosophies for how we solve the issues in our community. Can y'all hear me well? That's good. Yeah. All right, cool. So um, first we're gonna start, today's lecture is gonna be about like, this is some stuff that we all can take home no matter what level of the game we at in regards to real estate development, entrepreneurship, investing. And it's really about how we build family wealth as a community. Because it starts with first the individual, your mindset, and then that family structure you build. And then that family and multiple families make a community or make a village, which then make a nation. So we want a nation build and we want to be successful as a community. And for me, for the last several years, it's been about bridging the wealth gap because for the last several years, and prior to the last several years, for 450 years, every year on year, the black community has been in last place in America in regards to family wealth. Right now, the typical median net worth of a black household in America is a little over $9,000. It's between nine and $11,000. For a typical median family worth of the first place community, European Americans, that typical net worth is about $111,000 to $113,000. So we had about nine to eleven thousand, about $111,000, $113,000. So we have to do some things differently as a community if we want to get somewhere differently. And so for me, uh, one thing I thought about and made Facebook Live or Instagram Live, and you guys are welcome to Facebook Live or Instagram Live. My Facebook, make sure you guys are sharing and commenting this video because these are the kind of messages we need to go viral. These are the kind of messages that you guys need to take notes on and embody and then huddle up with your family, your friends, and your sphere of influence and get everybody on the same page. It starts with how we think and how we think about money. And so um, one of the first things I want to talk about today, just for those of you who don't, who don't know me or heard snippets of my story, um, the reason why... There's two or three reasons why I go by Mr. Real Estate, and I kind of phase that out a little bit, but you know, it still, it still sticks. Uh, part of the reason why I go by Mr. Real Estate, or been called Mr. Real Estate for the last nearly 12 years, is because first and foremost, it was the name of my first company, the first business that I ever owned, the first legal business that I ever owned. It's called Mr. Real Estate LLC. And when I say legal business, that's because before I got into this career as a real estate developer, as a real estate crowdfund manager, as a oh, real estate investor, entrepreneur, a school owner, an author, a TV personality, as a lecturer. Before I got into all of these careers and been in a position where now I'm managing over 10 million in assets. Um, before I got in that position, and I did all of this with no college education, but before I got there to that point to be that guy, this guy, the man you see today, I started off as just a boy in the hood, a Section 8 kid, a welfare kid. Someone, I was talking to Queen Betty today, and my daughter's mom texted me, you know, my daughter started school today, my, my youngest daughter. So my oldest daughter went to college a couple weeks ago and my youngest daughter started school today. And her mom said, yeah, she got her outfits planned out for the next three weeks for school. I'm like, damn, I have my, I only have like four or five days of outfits. Yeah. We had, oh, she was like, Queen Betty was like, nah, no, Jay, you exaggerating. I'm like, no, we had three pair of pants and five shirts. That's what you got for school shopping. You got three pair of pants, five shirts, and one pair of kicks. And you better switch that joint up. And hope your older cousin give you some hand-me-downs. And so I grew up under a different kind of environment than what I'm able to provide my children with today. I grew up under real poverty. I stood in the welfare lines and the WIC lines with my mom. My mom was a single mom at 18 years old. I went to prison visiting my father. For the first several years of my life, my, my, and it wasn't even my biological father, he left when I was three months old, but I was visiting my stepfather who was in prison for armed robbery charges. And so I grew up hearing stories about my mom who was a hustler, a drug dealer, and a drug addict, and my grandfather who was a drug dealer, and my uncle who was a drug dealer, and so I grew up under the influence of the hood, in the ghetto. You're a real estate guy. You're all right. <laughs> and so growing up, with the, with growing up in poverty, but then seeing those kind of examples, by the time I went through everything I went through at home and 
my stepfather and, and, and was suffering a heroin addiction and I went through different abuses in my home and grew up angry and just grew up mad at the world and grew up figuring like I had no way out. By 15 years old, I dropped out of high school, going 15 or 16 years old, I dropped out of high school in 11th grade, was homeless, living from friend's house to friend's house, just started selling dope for the first time, learning the tricks of the streets, working for other people, getting packs. And by 16, 17 years old, went back to high school to the Bass Kids program, so I could graduate, but end up being a full-time drug dealer and drug trafficker. Started selling drugs in New Jersey, getting work from New York, trafficking down to Baltimore, then all the way to Lincoln, Nebraska, at 17 and 18 years old. And then at 18 years old, four months after I graduated the Bad Kids program, where I went to high school from, from noon to 6 p.m., four months after that, I landed myself on Rikers Island in Mod 3 Upper, uh, on the C-74 building, facing three years to life in prison at 18 years old. And went to New York prison only to get more criminally educated, I call it. Prison didn't refine me, it didn't, it didn't instill anything new in me, but other criminal skills and better ways to hustle. And so, before I went to jail, I was in Baltimore hustling, and one of my OGs, he gave me, he planted a seed with me, he gave me some sound advice. So at that time, I bought my first Rolex at 17 years old, and I was showing him off my watch. And he said, Slim, you can buy all the cars and jewelry you want, but God ain't making no more land. They'll continue to make new watches, they'll make new Benzes, they'll make new material items, but God ain't making no more land. Whoever owns the most land wins. And that even at 17, that sentiment made sense to me. I still went back to trapping, but the seed was planted. And so after going to New York prison, facing three years of life in prison, after coming home from prison, and a year later winding myself uh, up in two more felony charges. So while I'm on parole in New York, I end up bailing out in Jersey on a felony charge and caught another felony charge in Maryland for drug trafficking, which I bailed out for, went to prison for, and did a year, another year and a half in prison. And so I spent my whole, a majority of my early 20s and most of my teens selling drugs or in and out of prison. Until at 25 years old, after being on parole, getting a job at a mortgage company, being awakened to the possibilities of building credit and leveraging credit and understanding how financing works, that again planted another seed in me. This is before Mr. Real Estate. I'm just a young king out here trying to get it. I'm just trapping and, trapping and dying. That was it. And so these seeds kept getting planted about real estate making sense. All the way up until my mother, who we grew up in government assisted housing our whole life, until one day when I was a teenager coming from jail, my mom decided to try an FHA program and she bought a house for $100,000. She had three grand to close on the house. I gave her that three grand. She closed on it. I thought nothing of it. But three years later, that same house she bought for $100,000 without us doing any renovation to the property, that property went up $100,000 in value in three years. We gained $100,000 in equity. We didn't know what the hell equity was. All we knew, we had to live somewhere. And she just didn't want to be the tenant. She just didn't want to be getting Section 8. And so um, my mom, going through the process of being a homeowner, uh, end up going into foreclosure and had a tax lien on the property because my stepfather, who was the other income of the house, again, was still suffering a heroin addiction. So the money that he was bringing in the household was going right back out the household into the block, onto the streets. And so one day when my mom was losing the house and she told me about it, I'm riding around in a brand new Navigator I paid cash for off the lot. And I said, I can't be riding around in style with my mom is losing her property. That's, that's whack to me, that's lame, that's corny. So I sold my, my truck, paid my mom's foreclosure and tax lien off, and she ended up keeping the house. And she said, Jay, when I, when I get right, I'm going to take care of you. I said, don't worry about it. That's on me. But she ended up selling the property a few months later, and she made about $100,000 in profit just by living in the property, and she gave me thirty-three grand for my investment to pay off her foreclosure and tax lien. So that was like my first real estate flip. So I gave my mom about twelve grand, and she gave me back thirty-three grand all for paying off her foreclosure, right? She was a, a distressed buyer. I was the distressed seller, motivated seller. And so I took that 33 grand and I went and bought a half a bird with it. <laughs> went back to the streets. <laughs> that trip didn't go well. And I still found myself on a corner just like this in North New Jersey on a street called 10th and Springfield where I was selling dope at 25 years old or approaching 25 years old. And I started to have a talk with myself, started to evaluate my life. 
And I'm like, damn, Jay, you about to be 25 years old, but yet here you are, three-time felon, no college education, you know, been in prison a couple times, you might have had some cars and some jewelry and maybe a couple good parties, but I haven't become anything that my mom and my daughter could be proud of at 25 years old. I might have provided some money for my daughter, got her some clothes for school, but I wasn't a dad that she could speak highly of. And so, I started thinking about that, then I started thinking about the company I was keeping on my block, where I was hanging out with real killers and dope dealers. And I had to ask myself, where was I going to be when I was 30? And the only thing that I could imagine at that time was being dead or what? Dead or what? In jail. Dead or in jail. And so at 25, when I looked at my story as a three-time felon who only spent time grooming himself as a drug dealer, I never groomed any other professional skills. I never learned any other professional trade or training. I never had any other strategy outside how to cook coke, bag coke, bag up coke, compress coke, transport coke, get stash boxes. Every skill that I learned had to do with the drug trade. But I never gave myself any other kind of skill, so I challenged myself that day in 2005 and asked myself, was I a drug dealer or was I a hustler? But see, a drug dealer only can sell drugs, but a hustler can hustle anything. And so me challenging myself and believing myself, I said, well, what would happen? I, learned, I heard about real estate when I was 17. I heard about real estate when I was on a parole program at 21 years old, 22 years old when I worked as a loan officer for six months. I learned about secure credit cards and financing, but then went back to the streets. I learned that real estate made sense when I saw my mom just make $100,000 by living in a property we did nothing to. So I knew that real estate made sense, and I, and I say to us, we know that real estate makes sense because everywhere that we go is real estate. People question me, is that real estate thing for real? Do you live somewhere? Ask your landlord. You don't gotta ask me the real estate makes sense. Ask your landlord. Ask the hotel owner. Ask the business owner. Ask the farmer. Ask the banker. Ask the club owner. Ask the restaurant owner. Ask the school owner, the church owner, the mosque owner. Everywhere we go is real estate. You don't gotta rely on someone else to convince you that only real estate makes sense for you. Does only a piece of the earth, only a piece of the land that control the power makes sense? Hell yeah. So I had to ask myself at that time, um, what would happen if I took my, my salesmanship, my charisma, my swag, my skills, my hustle, my outwork to work mentality, what would happen if I took that from the corner but took it into the corner office and did it full time? Like both feet on one side, not one feet on the other, like I'm gonna hustle during the day but I'm gonna try to do real estate at night. It don't work like that. So I challenged myself to see what would happen in 2005 and I went full steam into real estate. I broke my trap phone. I still had drugs left. I gave them away to my partner. And I went back to the mortgage company that I started working with. Got a job as a loan officer. I went under my name and bought my first house with my mom's money that she got from the sale of her property. And bought a single family house for my mom. Then went and got my first two family home with four acres of land. Then I got another two family home. Then got to my first flip. When I seen how much the realtor made, off of my first two family purchase, the realtor made 13000 I was like, he ain't even do shit. Excuse my language. <laughs> All he did was show me the house twice and he got 13 racks. So I went and got my real estate license on top of my mortgage license, on top of owning three or four properties at that time. And so that's when I decided and I learned about forming your own LLC, your own company, and being my own business owner and being an investor. And so then I just went ham, as yeah, I always knew how to do in life, I just went ham with the real estate game to say, well, I went ham on the block. Or ham on I-95 and trafficking. I just put in work. And so for putting in work as a, a loan officer, I worked my way to, to a branch manager and managed two mortgage branches, worked my way up to a celebrity realtor, worked my way up to a portfolio of over four million of property at that time, and made my first million in real estate in just three years as a business owner. And so from that, I grew, and my brand grew, and I started writing books, and grew more literature. I'm trying to get a fast forward story, but the point is, I've been doing this for 12 years. But I, I come into this industry in the most unconventional, untraditional way. But when you look at my story, this is my real story. Like a lot of times y'all hear experts and gurus and motivational guys, and they really, their story all choppy. You really don't know what the hell they do. How, what they do, how they made their money, where they come from. 
Like, no, I come from the hood and it's verified. I come off of out of prison and it's verified. I come through this real estate game and it's verified. Everything that I've accomplished. And so, what I charge us with, what I'm going to teach us today is a condensed version of what I've learned over the last 12 years. It wasn't magic. It wasn't some fairy dust that just God sprinkled on me that made me become me. It was a lot of hard work, but outside of the hard work, it was that I dove in and I, and I caught strategy, I caught game. I caught a knowledge base on something different. And that's what I want to give us today. I started thinking differently about money. I started thinking differently about my habits. I started thinking differently about who I hung around. I started thinking about differently about my goals, my end goals, about being wealthy and not just hood rich. So I just grew up and I evolved and I dove in and started learning more and more about business and where to this day I've owned like over a dozen businesses. I've owned restaurants, I've had liquor licenses, I've owned nightclubs, I've owned record labels, I've owned courier service, I've owned school uniform collections, I've owned uh, just all types of businesses that you couldn't even think of that I've either spearheaded or partnered in. And so outside of real estate, what real estate really taught me was how to be an entrepreneur, how to be a business owner. And that's what's really lacking in our community. So the first lesson I want to give us Let me get some help right here, right here, please. Thank you. So the first lesson I want to give us is a lesson on how we should think as individuals, how our family should think, and how our community should think when it comes to money and ownership. The reason why we're last in the wealth column is because we are the least business owners, we are the least property owners, the least land owners, the least homeowners. We don't own ish. That is the problem. And many times in our community, we think we have a wealth problem or we have a money problem as a reason why we don't own more, but we don't have a money problem. Money is not our problem. We spend over $1.3 trillion a year. We have money, and there's, there's access to money. What we lack is strategy. That's what we don't have. No one ever gave us the game. Coming out of see, our condition, you're coming out of our enslavement, you're coming out of our Jim Crow and our coin cell pro and our vacancy tactics and our black codes and our history as a people, no one ever gave us a financial education. So we had grandma say, boy, don't use them credit cards. Or your mom say, make sure you pay the rent. Or I don't want no home, I don't want to worry about the roof leaking. We got, see, I posted on Instagram today. Be, being, being poor is, is a mindset and it's a learned behavior. Just like being rich or being wealthy. It's a mindset. It's a learned behavior. You're taught to be wealthy. You don't just, just stumble on the knowledge of wealth. You're taught it. And so when families start creating wealth, what they do is they start teaching their family. They just don't inherit, just smart families anyway. Just don't, just don't pass down just money to their family. That's when you see people pass down properties and then a property be a foreclosure in three months or pass down a business to their, right, where grandparents or mom pass down a business to their siblings or their kids, but then that business goes to crap. It's because they never actually gave them the game. It's not just the business or the asset or the wealth you can pass down. Like, I can give you 100000 today. But do you know to do the 100000 once you get it? And so there's, there's two rules of thought that I want to I wanna leave, leave with with everybody. So, there's two men I study, and there's a book that I read early on in my career called Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, right? Many of you may have heard of it. Now, it's a pretty good book. It's something I, I suggest that you read, something I've read that definitely opened my mind to things. It comes from a different perspective a little bit from how I grew up, but it's definitely some valuable gems in this book. But I'm going to give you a little crash course of what he says. And this is by uh, Robert Kiyosaki, so we'll put, we'll put Robert's name up here. Something like that. And then, I don't know. And then there's also a book and some lectures online by a, a, a chain by the name of Dr. Claude Anderson called Poweronomics. I just want to give you two.
This is probably the most important thing you'll get out of today. If we can change our mindset about, if we can understand our condition, understand what wealth condition looks like, and then change our mindset in regards to money and wealth, we'll be better off as a community. I guess somebody hold it. Brother Benny, hold this for me. Okay. All right. So here's what we gotta change our mindset. So here's what rich dad, poor dad, Robert Kiyosaki said. Now I don't agree with everything he says, but I do agree with a large part of this principle. One thing with him is that he said he had a rich dad and his poor and a poor dad. The thing is, his poor dad made like 80 grand a year though. So he called his poor dad that he got to make 80 grand a year. In my world, that was a rich dad. But I, I get it. So what he talks about is that, he says there's just four quadrants, right? There's employees, there's the self-employed, there's business owners, and there's investors, right? These are, so now I'm gonna go to Dr. Claude Anderson's side. Dr. Claude says three, but I'll break it down to four as well a little more differently. He says there's like, there's four tiers. Okay? So, here's how everybody, no matter who you are, no matter what color you are, no matter what race you are, no matter what nation you're in, everybody has to survive. Everybody has to eat. They need food, water, and shelter, right? And clothes, for the most part. So in order for you to survive and eat, you're gonna fit in one of these four categories. It's, 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 it's hands down unanimous. You're either going to be a business owner, You're going to work for a business, right? So you're going to be an employee. He says the government's going to take care of you. You're going to get government assistance. Or you're going to rob and steal. You're going to break law. And why he says that is because at the end of the day, if you don't own a business and you don't work for a business, you have no salary, no check coming in, and the government is not taking care of you, but your kids got to eat, what you going to do? You're going to take a loaf of bread. Or you're going to find a way to hustle up something to go buy a loaf of bread. You have no other choice in life but to survive. You will survive one of these four ways. So what... Robert Kiyosaki says, and what we're trying to reprogram our community with is this. This section right here, this quadrant right here, this is all where you trade hours for dollars, right? On this side. You're gonna trade your hours, and then you're gonna get some dollars. Meaning, you're an employee for someone else, you give them your time, and then they give you compensation for that time. Now, if you're self-employed, but you truly haven't set up a business model yet, you work for yourself, but you're still trading your own time for then for money. Because you have no systems, no operation, no one working for you, you're just self-employed. You employ yourself. You're still an employee, but you work for yourself. On this side of the, of the quadrant is where Your money makes money for you. It's what we call autopilot. This is a section where we gotta start striving more to. That's this, this, this side right here is where you're a business owner. And let's talk about, again, why we love real estate, is real estate is one of the most, it's the easiest business model for anybody to, to understand. It is basic. I'm gonna show you how basic it is. This, this business model of, be, of being a real estate investor, which means that you either make money off real estate by leveraging property, which means you can simply sell contracts, assign contracts and make money. You can rent out properties as a landlord or lord of your land and make money. You can make money off the real estate by renting out sections in the club or renting out salon booths 
or by owning and getting appreciation and equity, we'll go over that. But as a business owner who's in real estate, you always have a customer. Because everyone always needs somewhere to live. So here's the proof of that. We're gonna do a quick Dallas survey real quick. I need everybody to be honest, nobody needs to be embarrassed, we're all family here, and nobody needs to be too cool. So by show of hands right now, on the corner of MLK and Malcolm X in Dallas, by show of hands right now, who here lives somewhere? You don't live with me? Not right now? You. Oh, okay, I see, I'm sorry. His head was blocking it. I'm about to say. I was going to help you out. I was going to add, we got some. All right, wait, Queen lives. She, she lives, he lives somewhere? Queen lives somewhere? Right, so, everybody lives somewhere. So, we're going to get into how you exploit or leverage that, right? You always got a customer. So, when we get more on this side, it's this business ownership side is where the world wins. It's this side. Investing, whether that investing is investing in businesses, franchises, stocks. Is how do you get your money to make more money for you? See, what we do oftentimes, we be. This is what I learned early about money. And one of the things that we need to, to adopt is that the purpose of money is not to spend it. The purpose of money is to invest it, to have your money make more money for you. So what happens a lot of times within our community, whether you got somebody that goes to the NFL, they go to the league, or you hit the lotto, or you get a tax return check, or you get a lawsuit, or whatever it is, what happens is, maybe some e-break there. What happens is, we get money, we'll come into $100,000, and instead of investing this money in a vehicle to make this $100,000 work for us, all we do is spend it down. So if you got $100,000 today, you're like, oh snap, I just got 100 stacks, I just got 100 Gs. I just gave up a buck. But now you go out and you go buy you a $100,000 car, even if you lease it or finance the car. And then you go buy new clothes, and now you go out to eat more, and now you're going to go treat your woman more. Now you're going to go celebrate to your kids on vacation. All you're doing is spending down the money you have. Now your money can't work for you. And that's often what we do. Again, being poor is learned behavior. We'll get our tax return. We'll get our lawsuit money. We'll get our lot of money. And I understand it. It's because when you grow up, now Jay-Z said it. If you grew up with holes in your zapatos, if you grew up with holes in your shoes, you celebrate the minute when you have it though. So what happens a lot of times, we're not used to having money, so soon we get money, it's celebration time. But then at celebration time, you look up, you're like, oh snap, okay, we spent 10, I went out with my boys, we spent 10. I went and got, went and put 15 down in that car I wanted. Oh man, we'll keep up with the Joneses, I had to go shopping, I had to go get a watch, we was gonna spend 7,000 shopping. Oh, I had 30 grand in bills I had to catch up back on. And the next thing you know, you're 100, not 100 no more. When, when you're, so this is all, it's all poor thinking. But when you're thinking wealthy, when you're thinking rich, you're thinking long term, uh, that's one of the biggest things, you gotta think long term. I know the enjoyment of a great vacation, staying in a nice hotel room of some fly clothes on your back. I understand that feels good. But building wealth is not an emotional thing, it's, it's a numeric thing. It's about the numbers. So we gotta get in a position where the first thing we think about when we come into some money is how can I get this money to make more money for me? That's the first thing we gotta be thinking. And one of the first ways that we start to build wealth for ourselves is we have to start what we offer it with J. Mars Academy, but we gotta start doing financial assessments of ourselves. So what that looks like on the financial assessment side is one of the first steps that everyone needs to see and know. You need to know what your household expenses are. Every household, every person here should leave here, should leave here and commit to keeping an accurate and up-to-date monthly budget.
we gonna do when we get this and we got this grand scheme in our head but we don't even know how our money's coming in and how our money's coming out you gotta keep a profit and loss statement of your a budget of your money you gotta know how your, your household money looks this allows you to make adjustments and what it also allows you to do once you keep a budget and you know that you're spending four thousand dollars a month one of your first goals in thinking on that business owner investor side one of your first goals is what kind of businesses can I create or what kind of investments can I make that allow me to make this $4,000 a month that I'm bringing in. We call it financial freedom, aka lifestyle freedom. So when you take your monthly budget, what you're looking at is how much do I spend on average per month? Now you put your mind into gear thinking, what can I do with whatever money comes in my house? So one, how can I save more money? How can I become a business owner or investor, entrepreneur? And then what can I do that at least at the start makes me what my expenses are per month? So therefore, I don't have to trade hours for dollars anymore because I have three properties bringing me in this money, because I have a franchise bringing me in this money, because I have a small business bringing me in this money, whatever it is. That should be your first goal. Your first goal should be able to create lifestyle freedom for yourself by freeing yourself from your monthly expenses. As long as you got these expenses and you haven't created any kind of investments, any kind of businesses to make you this money, you're always gonna be trading hours for dollars to meet this amount of money. You won't be a slave to this, these expenses. And then one of the next things that you want to check in your financial assessment is you want to look at you want to end right here. You want to look at what your family net worth is. And we're going to give you some tools to be able to find all this stuff. You don't got to do it on yourself. We're going to give everybody an opportunity to get a, a free PDF from us that has a budget and a, a net worth calculator. What's important to know what your family net worth is, all that is, is looking at your personal net worth. It's looking at all your, it's looking at all your assets, everything that you own that has value. From jewelry, to savings accounts, pensions, IRAs, mutual funds, cash savings, real estate owned, the equity in the real estate, your businesses, and the valuation of those businesses. Looking at all your assets, and then looking at all your debt and liabilities and subtracting your debt and liabilities from your assets. That'll tell you what your net worth is. But now even to do this well, you need to know how to value your businesses, how to value the equity or value of your real estate. And once you know these things, you then can look at yourself and your family net worth and then give yourself a goal in regards to increasing your assets. See, all we think about is looking good, being fly, being entertained. That's our distraction. As a community, we just want to look good and be entertained. We want to be entertained on the blogs, entertained through love and hip hop, entertained on NFL Sunday, entertained through basketball, all we want entertained through comedy. We're too busy chucking and jiving, as opposed to worrying about the real priorities that's going to affect our family and our family legacy. Most of us don't even think of family legacy. We think about the club next week. So we got to change our, our mindset and our behaviors. So you look at your monthly budget, your family net worth. And you also look at your personal credit profile, which Will and I will be going over tomorrow. Oh, man. All these things tell you how financially healthy you are or not. And if you're not financially healthy, that's all right. Because that's when you implement the strategies to do something about it. You gotta take a clear look in the mirror at yourself and your finances to even know where you wanna go. If your credit jacked up, your credit jacked up. It is what it is. So now what we got to do? We got to fix it. You got to get on your good foot. If your family net worth is negative 30,000, then God damn it, you got some work to do. But to ignore it, to do nothing about it, is a disservice to not only you, but your family. You not knowing your family net worth and not caring about it. You not caring about your family's monthly budget. You not worrying about your credit profile and the credit profile of your kids. You're doing them a disservice. You're playing yourself and you're playing your family. 
So all this is about how we build generational wealth, how we build family wealth. And in order to do that, we gotta understand what family wealth looks like. So one of the first things we know in regards to doing something about this, yep. I want to go over what we talked about, the easiest path to ownership. Y'all follow me so far? Yeah. yeah. We good? Yes, sir. All right, all right. I'm like a pastor, y'all talk back to me sometimes, you know what I mean? All right. So, here's why I love real estate. Because everything I said, I know makes sense. I know y'all get that. But it can seem like an uphill battle going from where you at today to where you trying to go or desire to be. So we gotta break it down in phases. Like people look at me and I'm doing well right now. But this is 12 years of grinding. This 12 years of nine going out to that party. Like nine going to Miami for Labor Day. Nine going. I watched one NBA game all last season. One, the last one. I love basketball. I grew up with a basketball in my hand. But me watching them boys go ball don't put money in my pocket. I don't own a team yet. I don't own a stadium. I don't own a jersey. I don't own any merchandise. I'm only fixated on things that I own. Like you look at my Instagram, I only follow my companies. It's not because I'm too cool to follow nobody else. No, because I'm concerned with the health of my companies and my movements. I want to know how they're doing. I don't need to be distracted by what the latest shave room post is. I can do that on my super spare time. But it's time that we locked in, you gotta prioritize your businesses, your companies, your family health, and your family financial health. Like that's important to me. So one of the easiest things that we all can do, you gotta know it's a, it's a long journey, right? It's okay, it don't, it don't gotta happen overnight, as long as it happens. It don't gotta be instant, it don't, it don't gotta be microwave. One of the easiest things that we can do to start building family wealth is home ownership. And I'm going to tell you why and how. And again, for those of you who already own homes or are already investors and are just here for support or want to hear something a little more upscale, this is the information that you need to take tips from what I'm teaching. And if you already know this, who are you teaching this to? It's not just for Jay Morrison to give back. This is the everybody give back. We all down. We all one community and, we, and the score is zero to 450. We losing right now. That's why I'm on this corner right now. I'm on this corner for me and what's going for us. Because we are losing as a people. And so if you don't like your situation, if you don't like your condition, you got to do something about it. It's very simple. If you don't like your situation, you got to do something different. You can't continue to do the same things for different results. That's insanity. That's crazy people talk. So one of the things we know we can do is home ownership. I believe that when you can try to own a multifamily property, that's anything that's one to four units. As well as just anything one to four units is called residential real estate, right? Residential real estate, res re. And when you purchase residential real estate as what's called the owner occupant, which means you, the owner, are gonna live there, they call it owner oc. As an owner occupant buying one to four unit real estate, you're given a lot of leniency by the banks. And outside those one to four units, you could even get what's called residential mixed use, which is one to four units, including a store or commercial property. As long as that commercial unit is less than the residential units that you have. And you can buy these things as an owner occupant, meaning you're gonna live in one of the units, one of the residential units. So you can learn you can have anything one, two, four units you can own as an owner occupant. And here's the benefits to you doing that. So first and foremost, what we're missing at is power and control. We often see in our communities what's called gentrification. That's where more affluent communities or private investors come into urban communities or poorer communities, buy up all the real estate, redevelop it, raise the prices, and kick your ass out. 
called gentrification, happening all throughout the country. The reason why it's happening is because we call these communities our communities, but they really ain't our communities. We don't own enough in the communities to call them our communities. We're leasing the community for somebody else. We're renting, we're borrowing the community. Whoever owns the most land has the power. Whoever has the land calls the shots. So the reason why we're getting kicked out and moved from our communities is because we don't own enough in the community. And so when you own the real estate, not only do you own the building structure, but you also own the air rights above the real estate. The ability to build up, that's yours. You own that power, you have control over those air rights. You also own the mineral rights below the real estate. That's your agriculture. That's your diamonds, your gold, your dirt, your gas, your oil. You own the land below the real estate. And so when we own more property, we then have more power and control in all these different ways. And one of the next biggest for us, as we try to bridge the wealth gap, leveraging the easiest model of ownership, is cash flow. When owning a real estate and you're living in one unit, you're able to rent out the other units, and then these units pay for your mortgage and your living, or make you a profit. Now, even if you were living in just a single family home, there wouldn't be cash flow because there's no other units, but what happens is you, are, you position yourself for next phase of cash flow. So even if you go and own a single family home. Everybody's loud today. <laughs> even if you go and own a single family home, one day you may want to move, upgrade, or downgrade from that property, and now you rent that single family out, and now you own another property, and then that's your cash flow. But if you're renting, let me ask y'all something. If you're renting, and you take care of your property for 12 years, 8 years, 6 years, 20 years. And you rent in, you mowing the lawn, the property smells good, you got the potpourri plugged in, you done beat your kids because the bathroom ain't clean. You in there taking care of this property for 20 years renting. When you're done with your 20 years of renting, how much do you walk away with? How much? And you're lucky you can get security deposit back. <laughs> so you can rent all this time, right? So we'll, we'll get to that in a second, about the competitive side of this whole equation. So you got your cash flow. Also, what many don't know and realize is that there's many tax advantages to owning real estate that you will not get from renting real estate on top of the cash flow and the power and control. And then there's what's called appreciation, which has a cousin called equity. So what appreciation is, appreciation is when assets go up in value. And depreciation, or things go up in value. Depreciation is when things go down in value. So what we do often as a community, as I mentioned, when we get money, when we get a check, most of the things we buy go down in value. Gucci belts and Louis belts and Hermes belts and bags go down in value. Unless it's some exclusive limited edition one of one might go up in value type of bag. Cars go down in value. You go buy a quarter million dollar Rolls Royce Wraith today, by the time you get 50 feet off the lot, that car is depreciated in value 10 to 20% in one day. Beautiful car, but it's a liability, it goes down in value. That vacation you want to go on, right, or that celebration party you want to go on, it goes down in value. And so what happens is we spend so much of our energy and time on buying things that don't make us any money. When the goal should be to buy things that appreciate in value, go up in value. So I've told you about the story, my mom owned the property and it went up in value in three years, but just by living somewhere, Without doing any work to it, just owning the roof over your head. Ownership 101. We all raised our hand and said we live somewhere, you gotta live somewhere anyway. So by living somewhere, you inevitably, that property 
goes up in value because of supply and demand. And so that's appreciation. Now, when you owe on a property, whether you owe zero because you bought it cash, you buy property cash, you owe zero, that's fine, you owe zero. But if you have a mortgage, let's say you owe 150,000 on a property, 150K, K means thousand, like kilos. If you owe 150,000 on a property, and that property goes up in value to now 200,000, equity is the difference between what you owe on a property and what it's worth. So just by living in a property over a few years, maybe one year or several years or a dozen years, if your property went up in value 50 grand, that's now 50 grand of equity or new family net worth just by living somewhere. So if you were to continue to own, you'll continue to put yourself in a position for equity and appreciation. If you owe now, if you started off buying a property and you owed 150 when you purchased it, and over the next several years, it went up in value to 200,000, went up in value 50,000. But now you've paid your mortgage down, which is called principal pay down, you paid the principal of your mortgage down to now 140,000. You've now created even more equity by paying your mortgage down and a property appreciating, so now instead of just 50,000 equity, you created 60,000 equity. Just by living somewhere, doing what you're gonna do anyway. You're going to do it anyway. So now you're prioritizing the asset side of it. And so we got appreciation, equity, tax advantages, cash flow, power, and control. And so this is one of the reasons why we preach and teach basic real estate and home ownership and why we should be passing this on and nudging everybody in our community to get with it because this is how we actually begin to build. This is what gives us control and gives us leverage. If you're not a, a, a homeowner, a landowner, you are at the bottom class. And the competitive side of it is like this. This is how I look at it. I look at everything competitively. So I look at it like, if you're not the owner here, living here, getting the rent, but you're the tenant giving the rent, what you're doing is you busting your butt every day at the factory, on the truck, at the job, in the salon, at the PR firm, in the corporation, at the landscaping company. Whatever your job is, you busting your butt every day, all week, every week. And now your hard-earned income, your hard-earned income that you got up six in the morning for, you passing your family wealth and your hard-earned income over to somebody else to pay for their mortgage so they get the power and control, they get the cash flow off your back, they get the tax advantages off your back, they get the family wealth off your back, they get the appreciation equity off your back. All because you weren't disciplined enough, focused enough, or serious enough about owning yourself. And there's a time and place to rent. It's okay to rent. It's time and place for it. But it should not be habitual. It shouldn't be generational. It shouldn't be just what you do. Because you're worried about what the roof leak and what the, the faucet leak. Because you don't want a responsibility. Because you want master to take care of you. That's your other option. You can own it or have master own it and he can take care of you. Or you can own it yourself and do your family a good service by building family wealth. You go live somewhere anyway. Take on the challenge, take on the responsibility. And I'm gonna tell you about ways that we can actually make this happen. It's not as hard as we think. And this is just home ownership 101. But this is the first level and the first stage to us. And I'm telling you, when I, when I first got my first property and saw my name on the deed at 25 years old, I couldn't believe it. I'm just a year out, not even a year out of the trap. And I'm like, yo, me? Like, that's where we got the term Lord of My Land from. My book is called Lord of My Land. I have a book that breaks the five steps to owning a home down, right? Five steps of ownership. But I came up with the term Lord of My Land because I was 25 years old, pulled up to one of my properties, and my tenant was a middle-aged white woman, and she had her kids playing in the front lawn. I'm coming from the gym, has some gray sweatpants on, blue Yankee fitted on backwards, pulled up my Range Rover, bumping Lil Wheezy, right? So I hop out the truck, I'm thinking I'm cool. And the kids say, the landlord's here, the landlord's here. And I was like, oh shit, that's me. <laughs> I never knew that people look at me like the landlord. Cause I always, growing up, look at the landlord as somebody other than myself. So here I was at 25, 26 years old, the lord of my land. I was the big homie. I was the shot caller. 
And to have that feeling is a morale booster. It does something to your psyche. When you start ownership, and then ownership, and then you want to start owning more things and get addicted to it. You want to rack up on things that you own, that you control. And so, here's the how-to. You give everybody a simple blueprint on. Here's just some of the tips that we cover in my book, Lord of My Land, that you can take with you from you today. So, when it comes to owning a home, what, let me ask you all, what do you feel stops us as a community while we're in last place of home ownership? What's stopping us? What's, what's the barrier? Unity. Credit. Okay. Education, knowledge, money, mindset. Uh, so credit was one of the big things everybody threw out, right? Cool, we'll talk about that. Somebody said credit. We said money. We said knowledge. I say all these are second place or I went down. It's not even unity, it's not even that. What's stopping us is fear. Fear is the biggest thing that stops us from owning. Because you say it's your credit, and people that say that, what have you done to repair and boost your credit? You say it's the money, right? Like, I had a, I had a guy <coughs> inbox me last week, so... Let's try to try it. Let's tell my water. So, same thing goes for home ownership. I had, a, I had a king last week hit me on Instagram, right? We had a campaign for our online courses for this summer, 2017, with a $17 for the first month of enrollment to our online courses. Well, I'm teaching like way more game than this. We got over 90 hours of lectures, right? Weekly mentorship calls, every week ask questions on building wealth. This whole robust academy we have, $17. $17 for the first month, and then it's like either $100 or $149 for the, the months after, right? So King said, hey Jay, why don't you lower the price so we all can eat? He said, lower the price so we all can eat. So this goes back to our, our, money, our money thing we talk about home ownership. So I said, you know what? Maybe it's me. Maybe, maybe you know, maybe 17 or, or 149 is a lot these days, and maybe I'm just bougie with it. So I click on his profile, and in his second picture, he's smoking a blunt. So, so bored. So you asking me to lower our tuition from $17? Well, here you are smoking up your tuition. Same thing goes for many of us though. We say that money's our problem, but our kids run around with two and all sneakers on. You say money a problem, but you get in, you a happy hour every happy hour. <laughs> you say money a problem, but you buy a twenty dollar bag of weed every day. That's six hundred a month, seventy two hundred dollars a year. That's a three and a half percent down payment on a two hundred thousand dollar house. But you say money a problem. We say credit our problem, but we ain't been to a credit repair agency. We ain't gonna house a housing counseling agency. See, all these are the excuses for us not to do what we know we need to do. All these are the excuses for us to stay in our little box and not to do something we're uncomfortable with that's different for us. Ownership. All these are the excuses why you can just simply keep cutting the rent check instead of going through diving into your credit and paying off that bill, figuring out student loans. You say it's your credit, but how many of y'all be at the credit to cash workshop tomorrow who will teach you how to repair and boost your credit? We got a credit mastery course where he breaks down every way to rebuild, the proper way to pay off debt, not to pay off certain kind of debt, the way to build your profile, use authorized users, train lines, delete and inquiries. All these credit tips for $99 a month. $3 a day. If you grown and you can't figure out how to save $3 a day, you got some larger problems in life. There's Uber, there's Burger King, there's landscaper jobs, you can babysit. These are all excuses. 
Because I guarantee you, I can place any of y'all by show of hands. Who's here travel somewhere out of Texas? Ain't like. King, where you been? Uh, Thailand. Thailand and a lot of places. Did you eat in Thailand? You figured it out? Yeah. I won't talk about that in a second. We're going to do somewhere. <laughs> Queen, where you been? You? Oh, Australia. Australia? Did you eat in Australia? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. Uh, how about you, Queen? Bahamas. Bahamas? You from the Bahamas? Did you eat there? You sure? Yeah. Who else? Who else been somewhere? Go ahead, Queen. Oh. Jamaica? You from Jamaica? Okay, from South Dallas. All right, I can make it sure. I don't know if you're Jamaican or not. Did you eat in Jamaica? Yeah. I guarantee you, I could drop any one of us off anywhere in the world with three dollars, and your ass gonna eat. I drop you up in the middle of Thailand with three bucks. You you will not starve a whole week. For real? Doesn't mean that much to you. You gotta survive. You gonna figure it out. But when it comes to ownership, it just don't mean enough to us. So we say, oh, my, my credit jacked up. I, I don't make enough. I, I, I can do all that house stuff. You making up excuses. When that future concert come, when that Beyonce concert come, when Sean and your kids are gonna play football or whatever else it is you wanna do, you find a way, don't you? Don't you? You do. So when it comes to ownership, some things I want to give us and some tips, and first and foremost, with the credit piece, or one of the first things you everyone should do to see where they stand in regards to home ownership is get a pre-approval or pre-qualification. Stop trying to be the bank expert yourself and you ain't no damn bank expert. You don't know why you can't buy yet. I asked somebody tell me, oh, yeah, my, my, my credit is screwed up, I can't buy no house. And they had a 620. And they qualified for a mortgage. Many banks will take you down to a 580 credit score to buy a one to four family house. Well, you got a 589 and you're like, oh man, my joint jacked up. So you done told yourself something, you done made yourself an expert. You just know it all now. That's like me coming to Dallas, never having been in Dallas. And instead of asking my local guide, where should I go or use a Google Maps or use some kind of resource, I'm just gonna feel my way through. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just get from downtown to MLK and Malcolm X. Just cause it sounds silly. That's a poor mind frame. Instead of figuring out how can I, we always say I can't. Instead of changing, how can I? You never ask yourself that. So when you get pre-approved, they'll look at your whole profile and they'll tell you where you stand and what you have to do in order to get there if you're not there yet. So credit is very flexible when it comes to buying one to four family owner occupied real estate. So you you you, you see that through pre-approval. Secondly, when it comes to down payments, you'll find that many banks will allow you to own with just three to three and a half percent down payment. Three percent means three thousand down on a hundred thousand dollar house. $4,500 down on a $150,000 house. $9,000 down on a $300,000 house. So even if that is out of your reach right now, if you know what that looks like, you now have a goal to work towards. If you don't give yourself financial goals, that's why I said that budget was so important. Once you see your budget, now if you see your budget and it's upside down, meaning that you spend way more than you bring in, that means you got to bring in some more money. You got to outwork the work. You got to go hustle. You got to go find other side jobs and careers and, and get the work. Partnership, you got to be creative. There's no excuses, just results. But you got to give yourself some kind of marker to get to. So if you saw a house that's the, a house that fits you and your family is $200,000, which means you got to save up $6,000. And in most inner cities, there's down payment assistance programs. But you probably even haven't even looked yet because you've never had a how can I mentality. To even see if the Urban League or local chamber of commerce or Google has anything to say about local down payment assistance programs. In most inner cities you'll find they'll offer you up to 100% of your down payment. Not to mention that there's different 
outside of grants and gifts, you can get a gift letter from family for your down payment as well. Is that whatever your field is, and we're talking about real estate investing specifically, because it's the world's leading wealth creator is real estate. And so that's why we focus so much on it. But I love all business, I don't care what it is. If it makes dollars, it makes sense. But what we teach in entrepreneurship and in real estate is that you have to be the go-to person. No matter what your business is, hair salon, videography, PR services, poetry, whatever it is, you gotta be the go-to person within your sphere of influence for that particular craft. This is how, what I just talked to you about the opportunity cost of money, here's how you actually get leverage it. Is that you gotta become important enough, you gotta become what we say, I, I said it a few times already, Nobody's gonna loan money to somebody that's not knowledgeable or credible. Knowledge plus credibility equals influence. So what you wanna do is become a go-to person within your sphere of influence for whatever that business is. When people think of real estate, they should think of you. When they think of opportunity cost of their money or investing money, they should think of you. When they think of video services, they should think of you. So the way you do this, become this go-to person, is by becoming knowledgeable and credible. Credibility is built through marketing, networking, and branding. How you brand yourself. These are all things we teach in JMA. How I've been able to become successful even coming out of my background on the corner coming out of a non-traditional way into this business and other businesses to where I'm now the CEO of the Tulsa Real Estate Fund. America's first ever 100% black owned, 100% black controlled real estate crowd fund. How I'm able to get in that position is because I become knowledgeable and credible and I was able to build my credibility through my marketing, networking, and branding. So when you think of real estate, when you think of investment, you think of, that wasn't my accident. And that's what we teach, you have to do this on purpose. And then, outside of your current sphere of influence, you gotta continually grow that sphere of influence. So more people know about you. And the greater you do this, see, a lot of times we wanna skip steps. And that's part of our immaturity in wealth building and business, and entrepreneurship. And being a successful entrepreneur, you have to cement yourself as a go-to person. And so the person on the other side, your potential consumer or partner or whatever that is, investor, they gotta see you as serious. This is why the marketing and branding and network is so important. If you're telling me that you want me to invest in a project you have, or you have this app, you want me to invest in this app you have, when I go to your Facebook or your Instagram, you shouldn't be smoking a blunt or twerking. It doesn't say to me you're a serious business owner. Or when you're sitting down, you're having these meetings, you talking about building wealth and being an entrepreneur, you should be knowledgeable in the industry. One thing I talk about in real estate is, do you know what a ROI is and how you find it? Do you know what a cap rate is? Do you know what a purchase ratio is? Do you know what an LTV is? Do you know what an ARV is? You gotta be knowledgeable in whatever industry you get in if you wanna be successful at it. And so, this is gonna be your cornerstone for those of you who come under our mentorship or our coaching, we're gonna teach you this how to be the man or woman in your sphere of influence, whether it comes real estate investing or entrepreneurship. That's how you win. That's how we stay winning, our whole team. Everyone buys into this because you gotta realize people only look at you as what you show them. You tell people how to look at you. If you want, to see, if you want people to see you as a dope boy, well, your actions, your marketing, your branding is gonna be out of a dope boy. If you want them to see a professional or entrepreneur, they're going to see a professional entrepreneur. If you're an activist and your marketing and branding and your swag, your everything you give off, your content should be out of an activist. You tell people how to look at you in entrepreneurship, no matter what that is. So one of the biggest things in our community that I've found is that transition from going from everyday person, employee, working class person to now business owner and making you look at me as an entrepreneur and business owner. We all have that power. So now, on the investing. So now on our investing side, I wanna give you guys 
what the real estate game looks like from an investor standpoint. We talked about home ownership, and I want to give you what we teach, what you can expect when you work when you work with us, and just how real estate investing works and how simple it really is. And we're going to teach it corner class style. So the purpose of the corner class, as you know, is that I'm giving back and I'm relating to those who can relate to where I come from. And I'll break it down for those who can't relate as well. But this is for my fraternity and those who, again, come from my experiences. So here's real estate investing 101. So when I talk about home ownership, that's not investing. Owning your own home is not an investment. That's just owning your own home. That's owning the roof over your head, that's being smart. When it comes to investing, there's four major strategies when it comes to investing. One is wholesaling real estate, I'm gonna explain. One you may be familiar with. Buying and flipping real estate. The other is buying and holding real estate. The other is syndicating deals, the fourth one. This one we're not going to teach today. This is more advanced, but it's something that you guys can get from us. I'll do a quick overview on it. But the first levels, and this gets into more commercial real estate. It can be used residential as well. But the first levels of investing in real estate, the first one is wholesaling. This you can do throughout your whole career in real estate. A lot of newbies start this way because it's the way where you use the least amount of capital and least amount of credit of your own. Wholesaling real estate is simply being a middleman or middlewoman. But the way we teach it is different than you'll get from most online programs or lectures or the guys on the radio say, hey, I want to show you how to flip a house in your community. I'll be here. That, that stuff is different. So, you don't know the commercial I'm talking about, right? Uh, Y'all hear it also. Y'all go down to it and y'all be like, hmm. <laughs> I'm going to show you how to flip houses. My four step formula. All right, so, what we believe in again, whether you're in real estate or the streets, I'm going to compare how real estate investing is similar to the streets or the corner, right? So, in either business, you got to become credible. I'm telling you, everything starts with credibility. You couldn't be a successful drug dealer or in the streets if you ain't have street cred. If you was a clown, you get ran off the block. It's never gonna happen, <laughs> right? So in the streets, you need street cred. In business, you need business credibility. So many of y'all learn from YouTube and other programs how to wholesale real estate or be an investor, but you never learn how to be a credible businessman or a businesswoman. That's why your deals don't close. Nobody trusts you. This guy in the box says businessman or businesswoman. It says drug snatcher. You run around like a runner, like a worker, like a crumb snatcher, as opposed to a businessman, a businesswoman. So in order to be effective, you want to build business credibility. But what essentially happens is that in either business, and again, I'm not, you know I'm not promoting street activity, again, I'm making a correlation. So in real estate, you gotta know your product. Our product is houses, it's land, it's apartments, it's hotels, it's we call this inventory. But you gotta understand how to evaluate or analyze your product. That's another part of why many of us aren't successful in real estate. We don't understand the numbers and how to evaluate a deal. We don't know what's a good deal or a bad deal. Or how to find out in between. So right now, some of my partners and I from Dallas, we're working with the city and we're getting properties in Dallas for $100. Who here wanna go in on $100 properties with me? Why? 
He said you can turn it flip it to an end buyer and then yeah, get the right. Cool, so you was right, bro. Appreciate you, gang. <laughs> so that's one of our biggest flaws right there. You want to go in a property as a hundred dollar property because you can flip it and turn it over. But what you didn't know about the hundred dollar property is that it needed 170000 worth of work. And after a pair value of the property was 120000 So you buy the property for one seventy plus plus hundred dollars which is only worth one twenty. Now do you want it? See, every hundred dollar property is not a good deal. Every down property is not a good deal. Every foreclosure is not a good deal. Every short sale is not a good deal. But only a deal is a deal. I need you all to say that. Only a deal is a deal. One more time. Only a deal is a deal. Only a deal is a deal. And so that's what we teach. We teach deal evaluation. See, there's certain formulas you can use where you know every single trip, no guesswork, that I got a show enough deal. I don't care what you call it. Short sale, probate, wholesale, foreclosure, MLS, don't make a difference. But the numbers add up to me to be a deal. So you gotta be able to know your product well. Pounds or pills. You gotta know the difference between Loud and Reggie. You gotta know your product. So in real estate, you gotta be able to know your product. You gotta be able to know, look at a building, and I know what to ask for to know if this building is a profitable investment or not. I know I look at that vacant lot right there, and I know what I need to know to know if that vacant lot right there is a profitable investment or not. I know what I need to know. Therefore, it's no guesswork. Therefore, I'm not messing up my money or my credit or my credit partner's money or my, my financing partner's money or my bank's money. And see, having that information allows someone to be able to trust you and to partnering with you. Which is why I said knowledge and credibility is so important. That makes somebody feel comfortable when you say, listen, I got this vacant lot on MLK and Malcolm X. The vacant lot, they're asking 30 grand for it. I told them my contractors, they can build something on it for 140 grand. It'll be all in for 160 grand. The carrying costs are gonna be another 40 grand, it'll be in at 200. Add that 200, we can rent it out for XYZ a year, and our net operating income will be XYZ, and our return on investment will be XYZ. And your purchase ratio is 62%. Potential profit of 80,000. When you can go to an investment and you can talk the language of investment, you then position yourself to be business credible. So a wholesale of real estate, what happens is you contract the real estate and when you contract real estate, you have the purchase rights of the real estate. You don't own it, but you have the right to purchase it. And so with that purchase right, as a business credible person, you're also using your marketing and branding to build in an end buyers list or investors list, right? We call it end buyers. That could be families, that could be institutions, that could be investors, landlords, whomever. Uh, the 18 wheeler driver is blocking somebody in, so whoever's the big rig, I need y'all look at that. Thank you. So in wholesale and real estate, the cool part about it is you're simply a middleman or middlewoman. You contract the inventory, the property, because you know it makes sense. You then assign this contract, almost sell this contract for a fee to your end buyer. You never know purchase a property, you never use your credit, you are strictly a middleman that took control of the property through contract and then assigned that to somebody else who wanted it because the numbers made sense and because you were credible and they paid you a fee. The average wholesale fee is about $5,000 for that transaction. I've seen wholesale fees at six figures. As long as the numbers make sense, your end buyer is willing to pay it, that could be your fee. It's no different in the streets. You might got guys that's hustling on a block You might know you get your pounds in Cali for 1800 so I heard. <laughs> and you might know there's guys in your block paying 2500 You don't got no money though. But what you do know is you can take their 2500 and bring it here and make 700 in between. Being a middleman or middlewoman. Both 10, you made seven grand. It's no different. All you're doing is positioning yourself between the money and the product. Same thing in real estate. I'm telling you, 
you could be rich forever. You will never have to worry about working and punching the clock if you learn how to position yourself between the money and the product. Forever. And not just real estate. It could be a business, it could be a franchise, it could be whatever. But it's are you savvy enough, are you intelligent enough, are you knowledgeable enough to be able to be that credible person in between the money and the product? That's the difference. I can sit down and have conversations with billionaires and multi-multi-millionaires about their opportunity to be able to invest in inventory that I know makes sense and I'm in between their money, their millions, and some multi-million dollar product. And I'm getting mine in between. It's all about positioning through your credibility and your knowledge base. So now on the flip side, here you are. It starts with you always. But now instead of being a middleman and just getting a fee, being in between the money and the product, you're now still in between the money and the product on either side of the game. But now, you've learned how to get money to back you. Or you have your own cash. You saved enough of this wholesale money to have your own cash. So now you got cash money. You got financing. You got partners. And so now, you find an inventory that makes sense and you contract it. But now you're contracting it and it's for you. There is no middleman, there is no wholesale or no fee. Now you're simply buying the property and flipping it straight to the market for full profit. So you still take it to an end buyer. But now all the money is yours. Simply buy low, sell high. But you still gotta be able to evaluate a deal low, market to end buyers, and position yourself in between. But learn how to either build the money up through wholesaling and stacking up money, leverage your credit for financing, whether that's through credit lines, credit cards, equity in your homes, IRAs, pensions, 401ks, private partnerships, hard money, soft money, VA loans, FHA loans. These are all money outlets. But do you know how to tap into the money outlets? Do you know how to calculate your carrying costs? Do you understand your LTV, your down payment and prepayment penalties? These are, these are the simple things you got to learn within this money language to put you in a position to always get a bag. See, that's the dope part. That's how I became financially free and how I became politically and socially free. I can say and do what I want. So I cut my own check. No sponsors got to sponsor this. No corporations got to back me. We do this our own stuff. We fly our own team out to every city on our own dime, our own dollar. And nobody can control what we say. We created that freedom by simply living the strategies we teach. So same thing in the game. Buy low, sell your product high. Go to the block, sell it high. Now, the epitome of real estate or business, again, is looking at that monthly number of what our expenses are, and then also what our future expenses are. So right now you might be spending four or five grand a month, but in your dream life, you spend 25, 30 grand a month. And so you want to figure out how can I have enough assets, businesses or real estate to be able to make me that 30 grand a month, 15 grand a month, 20 grand a month. And that's called building a real estate portfolio. So it works the same way. It always starts with you. But now with the real estate, here's the cool part. You don't gotta start off being Mr. or Mrs. Real Estate. You don't gotta own millions of properties your first couple of years. Even you go, you had, we're gonna do a lesson on this in a second, but let me get through this. If you take your rental income, you now buy a rental property, or you got multiple single, single family properties, but you got rental income coming in every month. Now your goal is to buy the property, not to flip it for a big check. Your goal is to buy the property and get all the rental income coming back, paying your bills residually, monthly. On autopilot. No different than on the corner, in the game, in the streets. 
You can have your pounds, your birds, and your pills, and you could be buying low selling, high selling weight, or you could buy this, bring it to the block, and break it all down, have the block pay you daily. Constant cash flow, it's a cash flow game. The same thing in real estate. The epitome is, and you gotta keep buying and flipping homes, that's a lot of work. Eventually you wanna stack up money buying and flipping homes, so you got enough rental properties or businesses or franchises or whatever that pays you every month on autopilot and that covers your expenses. So what that looks like, yeah. I want to keep it real quick. Just to the back. I might want to come back to it. So let's look at it like this. Mm -hmm. We do something called our dream life expense sheet. We're going to give you guys. So if everybody real quick, if you guys take out your phones for me, I know some of you are recording. If you got another phone or we'll stop recording real quick. If you guys will write this down if you want to keep recording. Text get lit. That's L-I-T. If you guys text get lit to 69696, we're going to send you all a monthly budget. I'm going to send you a free ebook from a Wealth DNA kit. We're going to send you a Dream Life expense sheet, a financial network calculator, and a daily budget. It's really dope. It allows you to stay on track. This is our freebie to everyone, and you can stay in touch with our team. Text GET LIT, G E T L I T, to 69696. And so, in that, we have what's called the Dream Life expense sheet, right? It says get lit to 69696. And so in that, we like to play around and look at what does our dream life look like? And so we're going to do that today as a group as we wrap up. And I want to show you how realistic your dream life can be. So in our dream life, we're going to have a home that we live in, but we're also going to have some vacation homes. So in our dream life, how many vacation homes do we have? Six. I hear six. Anything else? Three. I see a four, two. All right, so we're going to average it out at four. So we got four homes in our dream life. So where are they at? Where are four, where are four vacation homes in our dream life? Hawaii. All right, Hawaii is one. How do you spell Hawaii? All right, that ain't my thing. What else? Africa. Somebody said Athens? Africa. No, I said Africa. Oh, where? Africa. Hamptons? Yeah. Hamptons, okay. Alright, Hamptons. We're in Africa. Ghana. Somebody said Ghana. Alright, where else we got? Aruba. What you say? Aruba. Aruba? Okay. Alright, cool. So, Hawaii, we probably get something over there for like 9000 a month. Hamptons, we're gonna be at like thirteen thousand a month. Ghana, we can live good for like seven thousand a month. I say Aruba, we probably can do like five a month and be good. All right. So in our dream life, we have a few cars too. How many cars we gonna have? Seven. Same one that said two houses said seven cars. <laughs> Uh, we're gonna have to build, we're gonna have a car for each crib. Yeah. Alright, so what cars we got? Right. This is your dream life, huh? You tell me. Rolls. Uh, we got a Bugatti. A Rover. Ghost. We got a Rover. We got a Ghost. Alright. Uh, somebody said Maybach. We're going Maybach. No, we'll do a fifth one. We'll do a Lambo, too. Why not? You never know we'll do a Lambo. <laughs> All right. So, we're going to say, a Bugatti, we're going to say that's four grand a month. The Rover will probably be about 2500 a month. The Ghost is going to be at 3500 a month. The Maybach, would be about 35 a month. How about three? 
and then a Lambo would be about another three a month. So then we're going to need a couple drivers. <laughs> so a driver make about 4000 a month. The second driver make about 4000 a month. <laughs> we got a couple maids. Our maids make it four a month. Yeah, we got a personal chef. I'm in the wrong business. I know that's right. Butler. Is that a masseuse? Oh my goodness. <laughs> They all get paid for that. You got gas, you got to put it in the wheel. Then we're going to say miscellaneous. We're going to say miscellaneous, 15,000 a month miscellaneous. <laughs> That's a miscellaneous. Huh? Yeah, that covered in the miscellaneous. Got it. All right, so we're going to add this up real quick. We got 22 here, 29, 34, 38. 40,500, that's 41, 44, 47, 50, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that's 7, that's 20, that's 70, 4, 4, 78, 78,000, 88,000, 93,000. That's true. That's true. The Airbnb makes the money back. Now you're, now you're thinking assets. All right. So to live this crazy lifestyle right here is ninety-three thousand a month. Live this kind of lifestyle, right? So let's look at it this way. Let's take a four-family home. Now, if we have a four-family home. And this Ford family is profiting us $2,500 a month net profit. So I'm get your calculator phone out, or a calculator on your phone out. Let's divide 93,000 divided by 2,500. 37? 37. So everybody pay attention real quick. To live this extravagant life right here, with a house in Hawaii, the Hamptons, Ghana, Aruba, Bugatti, Rover, Ghost, Maybach, Lambo, two drivers, two maids, one chef, one butler, and a masseuse, and 15,000 miscellaneous. It's a tussle, you drive yourself. What are you saying? A tussle, you drive yourself. Well, no, we just got these five right now. It's too late. It's too late. It's, it's, it's a wrap. I got you. This is what we chose. So, to live this lifestyle right here, you would need 37 four families bringing you in $2,500 a month. About 160 doors. 37 four families bringing you in to live this extravagant life. This is two property a year for 15 years. You don't gotta do it all at once. You don't gotta do it by the time you're 30. That's one of the biggest things that messed me up. Is that, I said it on our Vlad TV interview. Is that growing up in hip hop, listening to the whole, listening to Biggie, I thought that you had to be rich by 30. So being, being anything less than rich by 30 was like, oh, the end of the world. Then you get over 30, you're like, oh shit, I'm still alive. Yeah. Yeah. For real. <laughs> you're like, oh, life keep going on after 30. God damn, I ain't know. So a lot of times in our community, we try to cram everything in like we gotta be rich by 30, like 30 is 90. When if, if you live this life by 50 years old, are you mad? Yeah, no. You ain't mad at 55, 60, 65, or none of that. Here's the other dope part. Let's say we live half this lifestyle. That means you're talking about 18 properties to live half this lifestyle. And I know this is possible because I've personally done this. So I know this is possible. But it's all about are you equipped to do it though? That's what, that's what my whole, that's what our whole lecture is about. That's why we started the J. Morris Academy four years ago. 
It was all about how can I equip my people with the knowledge that brought me from the dude supplying the corner, standing on the corner in North New Jersey, hustling with Buds, Buds and Crips, somebody that could sit at the boardrooms and the meetings with multi-millionaire business owners and household names. It's all because I just equip myself. I tell you, it's nothing, there's no other magic to it. Also on that flyer, Or you can call our number, 1-844-JOIN-JMA. We need help signing up. But what's so dope, I'll tell you, the, the highlights of our school are this. One, in our courses you get either a six months or 12 months of weekly mentorship. That means every week you get to call in every Wednesday and ask whatever questions you want to ask pertaining to your business, what you're learning, what you don't understand. Do not let hanging. It's not like YouTube, y'all figure it out. We actually have to call in every week to speak to our experts and our team, including myself. On top of that, you get the last four years of all of our mentorship calls we had in the last four years. Over like 200 hours of calls. You get to listen back on old calls and learn from those calls. On top of that, we have over 90 hours of lectures in our Wealth Mastery course. Lectures on residential real estate investing, commercial real estate investing, stocks and finance, business mastery, self-development and self-mastery, and credit mastery. Understanding credit through and through. All the game, all the itch that we wanna know that we don't know, is all laid out right there. Plus your textbook, plus our private student community, and everything else that you'll see on our website as you guys go join. With the most affordable tuition, you can pay up front and get all your lessons the same day. Or you can pay monthly and get weekly lessons. So if you want to you want a budget, you want to pay monthly, fine. Get weekly lessons. If you want to get all your lessons off the rip and you want to learn everything right now and go bench learn, go pay for your tuition in full. Very simple. You still get the weekly calls for six months or for a year, depending on your course. So all that you get in our online program, and then we offer... Our one-on-one -on -one coaching. There's different levels to our one-on-one. -on -one. You can talk to Brandon about it or see it online. We have one-on-one -on -one with my certified and my protégés who I train to coach, who will coach you on wholesaling. You'll still get a call with me, dive into your blueprint, and then you have your personal accountability coach with one of my staff. Or you can get unlimited strategy coaching with me for a year. Brandon will tell you more about that. We personally get my cell phone, my email, and we build and we become partners. And I'll walk you through your business, like it's my business, and we'll get to the bag. So we got one-on-one -on -one coaching with me, or one-on-one -on -one coaching with my staff, and Brandon can tell you more about that as well. And then lastly, coming up in the next 60 days, it's not a Jay Morrison Academy thing, but it's our sister company. It's also a real estate fund. As I mentioned, we just launched our own real estate crowd fund. It's not a GoFundMe. This is a way that we all can invest together, be partners together, be equity owners together, and buy back our blocks. So the way Tulsa works. So everyone, I want to encourage you today, you can write this down. If you go to Tulsa, T-U-L-S-A, real estate, fund, F-U-N-D.com. You can learn more about our fund, but you also can open your investment account for free. So when we go live in 60 days, what happens is we all will identify projects, meaning hotels, homes, vacant land, whatever we want to buy. And we'll also fund other investors and developers. So the goal of Tulsa is to be able to have basically like a community real estate bank. And the purpose of the fund, it's a crowd fund, we all will invest into this fund. The minimum investment is just $500. So for as little as $500, you will be an investor into this fund and an equity owner and partner. The maximum investment is $50 million, so we can't invest no more than 50 mil, but minimum 500. And we will go out and we will go buy assets together. Apartment buildings, hotels, schools, hospitals, wherever we want to buy. Is it a purpose, what's that? We choose what city just based on the investment. It's not 
we have seven cities of focus. Uh, New Orleans, Atlanta, Baltimore, Chicago, Detroit, Oakland, and North New Jersey. But we are open to fund deals in any market where there is qualified boots on the ground. All right? So this is an opportunity for us to own real estate together as a community and everyone benefit and prosper from it. And within this, it's transparent. There's third-party administrators. You have your own account. You can see your investment 24 hours a day. And what it's doing is yearly dividends and everything else is spelled out on our website. So I want to encourage everyone to become a Tulsa Real Estate Fund account holder and investor in the near future. So it's like a uh, real estate investment trust. It's a real estate crowdfund. Well, similar, but I see, yeah, same concept, yes. All right, so we may do a little q and if we have time, but first, before um, it gets too dark, I want to introduce a special performer and have a special performance for us today. Hold on, I need some water. I got to do this right. But that's so dope, it's Martin and Malcolm right there, I know that. Uh -huh. But yeah, so, you know, the reason why I could teach financial literacy just online, right? I could teach it just in conference halls. I can just write a few books and do some panels and say, oh, I did my job. I'm a black man, I done made it, I gave y'all some books, god damn it. Go we'll figure it out. But I don't believe that's truly black love. Love is an action word. Yeah. And for me, I love my people. I love our people. And so the reason why we come on these corners and come into the streets is because we want to serve those least amongst us. And I want to show what black love looks like in the flesh. And so does my team. That's why we're here. It's like, what does it look like when a black man, when a black woman, when a black organization, a black school comes into the community on the corner, in the hood of 25 cities and pours into their people? What's that look like? we never seen it before, to this level, in the history of America, never. And so, um, we do that in everything we do in the spirit of black love. So, within that, I want to introduce you to my partner in love. I want to introduce you to my queen, who I knew was the bomb when she bought me that Quran. She knows I'm not religious, but I submit to the will of Allah. She knows I'm not Christian, but I'm something like Christ, because I teach in the streets, loving the least for life. So yeah, 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 she the bomb for that. What's even doper, she calls me king and promised to have my back. And I believe her. But we all know actions speak louder than words. And when it comes to loving a black man, ain't too many queens' actions louder than hers. And when it comes to the physical, ain't too many queens' asses fatter than hers. <laughs> but that shallow talk, compared to how a smile lights up a room. Natural hair and a stare has me hot like June. Like the hidden figure queens, I'm gonna take a pretty ass to the moon, and we out of here. See this queen I'm talking about, her heart is pure as gold, visits the elderly every day, good deeds for her soul, speaks up proudly for a race. See my queen is bold, and she nice with her hands, man, my queen is cold. She wiped the tears from my eyes and kept the story untold. She's amazing. See this warrior queen I'm talking about is one of a kind, Betty Shabazz meets Maya. Shit, this queen is mine. She bad and bougie got her own. Damn, my queen is fine. Black power fists in the air. See, to me, that's a dime. She's amazing. I want to introduce you all my queen, Ernestine the Dream. They're black men. I had dreams of one day you holding my hand, walking me down the aisle, giving me off to another black man that you saw fit. High hopes, high hopes that one day you, you would escape this system's fucked up grip, dear black man. You were supposed to be the first man I loved, the first man that loved me. But how can I expect you to know how to be in my life when you, you don't even know how to be in your own. Snatched from your home, chain whipped and stripped from every piece of truth, culture, and knowledge that you have ever known. Dear black man, my heart bleeds for you. My heart bleeds for little black boys who never got the chance to become black men. See, when you were a little boy, you weren't always taught to love because you were forced to work. Couldn't, couldn't fathom the idea of receiving love because before you hit puberty, your hearts and heads were already filled up with so much hurt, dear black men. 
my heart bleeds for you. My heart bleeds for little black boys whose childhoods have been robbed with no probable cause. To little black boys who no longer believe in Santa Claus. To little black boys who have been enslaved, incarcerated, sold, shot, chained, and whipped. To little black boys who have innocent, innocence been stripped. I bleed for you. They're black men. You come from gold, queens, kings, diamonds, and pharaohs, but can't wear your chain too low in the hood because then you look at as a stunner. But my heart bleeds for the Will Browns of the world who couldn't enjoy a blue winter because in Omaha he suffered a red summer. See, my heart bleeds for George Stinney. 14 years old, 90 pounds, wrongfully accused of murder because he didn't have the complexion for the protection. He was sentenced to death. He had to sit on the Holy Bible. He had to sit on the Holy Bible as a boost to see for dead black men when lifted by the Spirit of God, your soul they can't defeat. Dear black men, I'll gracefully paint an image of your face in the sky with the colors in my mind just so your royal legacy doesn't become myth. But those colors fade into shades of gray when I think about Thomas Smith and Abram ship dripping with hues of blue. When I think about James Cameron who escaped with a fucking noose around his neck, they're black men. I know it's hard to find truth in who you are since the day they snatched you off your throne. You've had to fight for your self-worth and respect. They're black men. I need you to know that you are the perfect definition of love. The type that makes the world spin. Dear black man, you are the perfect definition of love. The type I have been searching for my entire life. The perfect synonym of good, true, worthy, upstanding, high-minded. Dear black man, don't let this villainous, corrupt system keep you blindsided. See, see, my heart bleeds for Trayvon Mark. My heart bleeds for Jordan Davis. My heart bleeds for Sean Bell. My heart bleeds for Eric Garner. My heart bleeds for Tamir Rice. My heart bleeds for Oscar Grant. My heart bleeds for Philando Castile. My heart bleeds for Alton Sterling. Their black man. My heart bleeds. My heart bleeds. Their black man guide a little black boy so they can find their way back to being kings. Thank you. spirit of love and we do this in spirit of black and brown love and as we listened to minister farrakhan last weekend jay and i in atlanta he said nation building starts with the relationship building of a man and a woman and that's why i wholeheartedly believe Who, who's out here how many couples are out here anybody brought their queen with them their king with them so we can get this knowledge together and we can learn how to really build the foundation of our families and repair our relationships and that's what i 100 percent wholeheartedly believe in and that's why i'm with jay every day that's why i'm on the corner with him for free on 25 different cities every day because i wholeheartedly believe the way we build a nation is first building our relationship and repairing our relationship with black men and black women right yes all right so I wrote this I wrote this poem called Black Love. It's one of my favorite poems I'm in with you guys today. I often wonder if I was hopelessly hanging from a cliff, would you reach your arm out to save me? If I was desperately gasping for air, staring in the face of death, would you press your brown lips against mine and bless me with one last breath? Or have they made you completely forget about me? Black men, I'm speaking to you because it seems that over the years you've lost your love for us, but your love for them grew. But let's not forget the darker the berry, the sweeter the juice. And it's, it's not that she can't love you, it's just that black man, I was made for you. Sculpted by the hands of God to love, feed, nurture, protect, and compliment you. And there is no ands, if, buts, or maybes. It was the black woman's breast milk that even fed the master's baby. When you were young and fell and scraped your knee, it was your mother who was there to tend the stitches and fix your britches. See, the black woman has always been the black man saving grace, but somewhere between L'Oreal commercials, tanning salons, lip injections, and ass shots, you put us on a cultural rat race, leaving us with just enough fucking self-esteem for us to chase. Chase a dying breed of a man that's running so far and fast from home, we feel the need to pick up the pace, spewing words of vulgarity, calling us every name in the book, but the Bible says unto a woman, a man is supposed to speak life. The Bible says the man that's found a good thing is the man that's found a wife. But you freely spit these words of obscenity, robbing us of our royal grace. How could you call a black woman a bitch and go home and look your mama in the face? In society, we have you thinking the grass is always greener on the other side, but trust and believe when shit hits the fan, the bounce in her hair won't stop her from walking you and those papers straight to chase. And on that, we can bank. Black man, let me help you. 
the grass is greener where you water it. The more you water, the purer the fruit. And if you study the origin of your true history, you'd be watering at the root because mass media won't educate you on your royal oaths. See, they'll have you thinking our history started when we were shipped over in those boats. See, they want to make you forget about black queens like Amina, the queen of Zaria, Candace, the empress of Ethiopia, the queen of Kemet, Nefertiti. See, those are the faces you would never see on TV. And black men don't think shit changed because ain't shit changed since the 60s. They doing everything but wearing white hoods, burning down churches and flags. Every chance they get, they'll Kim Courtney and Chloe your ass. And I cried tears when I wrote these words because I'm standing here open like king. What about me? What about your queen? Don't let these false images of society make you run. There are still good black women out here walking fresh out of the pages of Proverbs 31. And we are crying out like I'm all you need. I'll sew the thread, I'll bake the bread, I'll keep you mentally, spiritually, emotionally fed. Black man, I will pull greatness out of you. I'm preparing myself for the day like the Bible says you, you leave your mother and father and we, we become one. I would happily give you your first son. We would be a great team and we would do things like, like, like I'll teach him how to tie his shoes and you teach him how to drill the screws and I'll make us all dinner and you, you could just do the dishes. But mass media has convinced you to need two chains and need two bitches. But just like your mama when you fall, I'ma always be here to tend the stitches and fix your britches. And my soul grows weary and my heart sometimes stings because through all the trials and tribulations, every inch of my body still believes the black man is king. And in case you didn't hear me, yes, the black man is king. And I'll bow down at his presence. And I believe God cut me from his rib so I can mirror his essence. Black man, take care of it, and it will take care of you. You see, you men always think you can do your dirty work and clean it up after. Like, let me come and her tonight, then tomorrow she can take the morning after. But what you men don't understand is you have to wash your hands before you touch your dick, not just after. Black man, take care of home. Treat your woman like a precious stone. With clean hands and a clean heart, touch her soul. Thank you.